So there's been a couple of times where I felt like in my travels where I've like felt like I was could probably die in this situation right now. I promise you're going to hear the rest of that story today in this episode. That is our guest, Mark Fox, an incredibly talented photographer who's based in Quito, Ecuador. Back in 2017, Mark quit his stable job as a cameraman in the UK to travel the world. Of course, this completely changed his life, led to the life he's living today. Mark is working with Amazon conservation organizations, collaborating with indigenous leaders and local governments for the protection of three world-class bio corridors for wildlife migration. And he has therefore visited many indigenous rainforest communities. You're going to hear some of those experiences and get advice on the best way to go about visiting indigenous communities as an independent traveler. We discuss his work in conservation. Of course, he shares travel advice on things to see and do in Ecuador, where he's based, what daily life is like in Quito. He talks about how being exposed to shamanism and the ayahuasca experience opened him up spiritually after growing up as an atheist. And I asked Mark how he gets some of these indigenous community members to open up and allow him to take their photo. As travelers, I think we see certain scenes or moments when we're out and about that we want to capture, but we don't want to be intrusive. And what's the best way to go about engaging with a local and having that conversation to get that photo that you might want to get for whatever reason? Uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity to get some advice on that so you'll hear that as well and one of the major threads i think running through this conversation that i found inspiring is just the fact that mark has combined travel his passion for conservation and photography to essentially build the life that he wanted to live and that he is living and i have some thoughts on that on the back end of this conversation and you're going to hear much more right now in this episode Let's get into it, shall we? Buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey, it's Jason here with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. And I've got some great news for you. We are going to be doing three episodes a week through the remainder of the year, bringing you three full episodes every single week. I've got a ton of content I want to get out to you, plenty of interviews banked, loads of value coming your way, so be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast if you haven't done that. Of course, it's free wherever you're listening now. Just hit that subscribe or follow button so you don't miss what's coming up. Next week, we have a theme. I've themed this out for you. It's called Upgrade Your Bucket List. It's going to be all about destinations to consider traveling to in the coming year, and I know If you're anything like me, (laughs) you love travel, you're probably already mulling over some of the places you might want to go. So be sure to follow slash subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss that. One other quick thing before we slip and slide into the interview, you can sign up over at zerototravel.com slash newsletter to get our free weekly newsletter. And now let's slide into this conversation with Mark. You can learn more about him at Mark Fox Photo. We'll link up to everything mentioned here in the show notes. Stick around on the back end if you'd like. I want to share with you something that I think is a move you can make that is never the wrong move and why. So you'll hear about that after the interview. For now, please enjoy my chat with Mark Fox. Thanks for listening. Mark Fox. We got a title for this now. Mark Fox. It's a cool last name. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds cool. Mark Fox. Yeah, it's very, like... very simple. Seven letters. <laughs> Just fit. Sometimes if even if you need an eight letter password, it's not even gonna be enough. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to give everybody a, a clue to what your passwords might be. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's not yeah. my name if anyone's <laughs> checking. <laughs> <laughs> I should say Mark Fox, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast and thanks for uh taking the time to hop on here. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. 
Well, I appreciate you getting in touch. You know, you sent me this email and I was instantly intrigued because anytime you hear somebody spending time with indigenous communities and immersing themselves in, in a culture in that way, I'm intrigued, man. So I'm, I'm excited to chat with you. You are based in Ecuador. Is that where you are right now? Yeah, that's correct. Here in South America. What is it about Ecuador? Um, good question. It's actually quite a common question I get asked, one of the first. So basically a little bit of a backstory. I'm from Jersey in the Channel Islands, uh, which is this tiny island off the coast of South Britain. Um, and then in 2017, I went traveling around the, around the world, really. Uh, but a large portion of that was in Latin America. Um, so I traveled from Argentina all the way up to Colombia and then from there onwards. And um, when I hit Ecuador, I realized that Ecuador has like a, it has the Amazon inside of Ecuador, but so does Brazil, uh, Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, and all of those places. So why, why did I choose Ecuador, I guess? Um, and it's because actually fairly simple, really, is Ecuador is a lot smaller, but it still contains all of the beauty of what South America is. So Ecuador has three regions. It's kind of divided in, into three regions, which is the coast, Pacific coast, uh, the Andes mountains, and then the Amazon. Um, but the beauty of it is that you can travel from the coast to the Amazon in a much smaller, smaller distance than you would in Peru, for example, or in Colombia or Brazil. Um, and also they use the American dollar as well as their currency. So it's kind of easy for the exchange and everything else. Um, so those, those are my main reasons why I ended up using Ecuador as my base. Well, the original trip, was it a like a gap year type of thing? Or what, why did you take off in the first place? Yeah, I um, so my background is kind of in nature photography. And then I went and worked for a TV station, a big one in the UK. Um, and then once I had reached a certain point in this uh, TV station, I kind of was like, right, I need to go travel. Um, and I did a smaller trip when I was younger. When I was in my early 20s, I did a, I did a trip off to like Thailand and Australia, Fiji, that kind of thing for three months. And when I was out there, everyone, everyone was telling me, oh, you've got to go to South America. South America is the place, like it's full of adventure and it's all these things. So it was always in my mind since that trip when I was like 22 or whatever it was. Um, so then eventually I saved up a bit more money and then two years later I then decided, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna go off to, to South America and just check it out, you know. But I mean as a nature photographer and uh, it sounds like you were working for a pretty prestigious television station, was a good job and everything like that. Let's use air quotes and call it the dream job. Did you have the dream job as you as you saw it maybe years prior? And was that hard to leave behind? For me, I, in my life, I've always worked in stages. So I've always had one thing going on in my life and always looking for the next stage. Um, and for me, so for me, when I was doing at university, like my nature photography, BBC Natural History Unit style stuff, National Geographic style stuff, um, I was learning all of that in university, but then quickly realized that with wildlife photography specifically, it was very difficult to make a living out of it. So I moved back and then I was like, what am I lacking in my tool belt of skills and one of them was video really so then that's when I was like okay I'm gonna build up all the knowledge I can with the video and production side of stuff um, and then once I've once I've re reached my peak then I'm gonna figure out what happens in that case it was kind of travel so by the time I got to Ecuador I had learned all of the stuff to do with wildlife landscape and National Geographic kind of style stuff um, and then I learned the production side of video and I worked in specifically news, so it was like telling the story of things like that. And then when I came here to Ecuador, it's kind of like, okay, how do I mix all of it together to then create a story that actually matters? And that for me was inside of the Amazon rainforest and just getting to know people, learning the culture, learning Spanish and everything else about it. It was kind of like the dream job for, for the moment. But once I knew I had reached the top from where I could achieve, then I, I just wanted to continue. Is the living your life in stages thing, is that intentional? Um, do you kind of plan things out in that way? You're saying, okay, well, this, this stage is ending for me, so I'm going to accumulate X, Y, and Z skills to then move on to the next stage. You know, I mean, that's a bit of a balance, right? Because you can, you can visualize 
a next stage in life, but oftentimes we don't exactly know where it's going to go or what it's going to look like. I guess I'm just fishing for some perspectives or advice around that approach. I think for me, it was kind of like, I like to kind of live in the present moment and all that kind of carefree style. But at the same time, you need a bit of structure in your life. And for me, I knew the dream was always to try and uh, go into something that's like the the BBC Natural History Unit, which is like the David Attenborough documentaries or like a National Geographic style um, life. Um, And that was always the dream for me since I was young. So it was kind of like a it was kind of, I don't know, it was just one of those those things where I, I realized I had achieved enough of what I was, but it, I wasn't fully fulfilled in what I was doing. And I always wanted to travel when I was younger. When I did that three months trip, for example, I always wanted more. Like three months wasn't enough. So I just wanted to take like a year out and just go and do it all. And then whilst I was on that year out trip, that's when I got the inspiration, if you like, of being like, okay, Ecuador, I'm going to stay here. This is where I'm, I'm going to move. And this is what I'm going to do next, you know? So, and that could change in, I don't know, five years or two years or 10 years. No one knows, I guess. You just got to just listen to yourself at the same time and see if you're happy in your life, I guess. It's an interesting thing to kind of have an idea of, well, if I get to a certain place, there's an expectation that I'll feel a certain way or, or might feel that I I made it on some level, right? But we all know when we, when we arrive at those places, it's not exactly like that, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. It's kind of one of those, but especially growing up on an island, it, you get that very much like living in a bubble feel. So you could be like a, a big fish in a small pond kind of thing. So you feel like you, you've you achieved a lot just in that small like island. But then in the grand scheme of things, if you go off traveling and you realize what amazing things people are doing around the world and what, what impact you could really do, um, you kind of just like boost your inspirations a bit higher and you know, everything that you want to do, you just, you just push it that little bit more. I guess that's part of my personality. I guess I always, I'm quite competitive in a way. Um, and I just want to keep doing like the best I can, you know? <laughs> what attracted you to free diving? I want to talk about that. Oh, um, free diving was when I was, yeah, in that three month trip, I went to Thailand. Um, so my course, I should say for university was, a marine, the label was marine and natural history photography, um, which incorporated terrestrial stuff, you know, like land-based work, but also under the water. But I've suffered with ear problems my whole life. So I've always had an issue. My doctor would always tell me, you can't go scuba diving, you can't really do any of this. So when I went traveling and I went into Thailand, and obviously it's amazing dive spots there. Uh, One of my mates was living out there. He was a dive instructor. Um, and he, he put me in touch with one of the, the local freediver spots. And I thought, okay, I can't scuba dive, but can I free dive? Um, so, I, and I've all, I used to swim when I was younger as well. I've always, I used to compete when I was young and all that kind of stuff. So I've always been in the water. I surf and I do everything, grew up on an island, et cetera. So when I found this freediving course, I was like, yeah, I've got it, I've got to do it. I've, I've, Doesn't I've that lived, sound like, like that's worse for your ears than uh... right, 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 right? But the doctor never told me I couldn't, right? So I was oh, like, I'm I just going to try okay. it out. You found I'm the loophole. See. Yeah, the loophole. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to try it out, see how I feel, and you know, I know my body, etc. And so I ended up going on it. Um, I had my like earplugs and everything to make sure it was okay, and we learned like the art of breathing, really, just how to hold your breath and how to control and maintain calmness and everything else. Um, and that was actually quite amazing because when I was there, we would dive down to like 20 meters and because it's like amazing dive sites there, we'll dive down and then there'll be people scuba diving there, but we would be just with our, our mask on with no snorkel or anything. Um, so that was kind of surreal, but also amazing at the same time because I was witnessing something that I'd missed in the last chunk of my university life with all of my friends doing the diving aspect of the course and I wasn't able to. So when I went there, I was like, wow, this is amazing. But of course, um, I did end up with an infection and it did did uh, affect me uh, a few days later. So it was kind of like I, I do it here and there, but I don't push it too much anymore um, just because of my ears. Yeah, unfortunately. You took a TEFL course as well, teaching English as a foreign language. Was that something that you utilized during your travels? I did it a little bit when I arrived here to Ecuador, actually, because for me, it was very difficult. Um, I knew roughly I knew that I wanted to go into the Amazon and I knew like I knew I was able to do that work. I was a working photographer for about, I don't know, eight years or so, nine years. 
Um, so I knew I could achieve what I wanted to do, but no one knew who I was or anything like that. I couldn't speak Spanish. I couldn't do anything once I was in Ecuador. So that was kind of the buffer, especially in the pandemic as well. It was the, the buffer of like learning just ha making some money when all the jobs got cancelled and, you know, not really knowing any Spanish when I first arrived as well. So it was kind of like one of those things where it was, um, it's useful to have for sure. If anyone hasn't got it and they want to go travel, it's one of the best. I've got, I've got friends that have just, you know, traveled the world using that and it's, it's so beneficial. But for me, I knew my purpose was always going to be photography. So it was kind of one of those step back kind of things. So if I ever, want to move to another country that will always be my first port call of okay I'll just start teaching English for now and then once I've got settled and know the language or know my surroundings then I'll start doing other things you know do you remember when you were first attracted to photography or where you felt like it was more than just oh it's fun taking pictures yeah it, it was yeah for sure so for me I was a skateboarder growing up from the age of me too never, oh cool nice what kind of board did you have Oh, I had plenty of different boards. I think my first board was a DGK or a Baker, something like that. Um, so, yeah, from the age of 11, I, I was into skateboarding and everything. We used to go into, like, skate local skate shops and stuff and be like, oh, can you sponsor us, you know, all that kind of thing. And the, the thing they would come back with us was, we need a portfolio. We need to see what you can do. Um, so we're like, okay, let's go. And we were like, just a couple of mates, you know, we were like, okay, I've got a camera, like a little compact camera. Um, and yeah, so then we just started documenting all the stuff we did, jumping down like street skateboarding, so jumping down the stairs or off ledges or whatever it might be. And we started filming, and I, I started to like do it more because of my skateboarding, but actually, I was learning a skill that now is obviously proven quite useful. And then when I turned 14, my school um, had just opened up a new course, which was photography. So I thought, I can't paint, I can't do any, any kind of like artistic things in my life so I thought oh photography I've done that with skateboarding so maybe I'll just do that um so yeah then I went into photography from the age of 14 studying and then I never stopped studying from 14 up until university when I left at 21 so it's always been in my life really always a thing that's always been there um so when I did graduate in the age of 21 um from university I just thought Oh, okay, I guess I'm a photography now. Photographer. I just didn't really think make that connection of being like, okay, I graduated, what's next? Like I didn't really think where am where am I gonna work? I'm moving to like the real world, like, you know, the adult world, like now I've got to work, what do I do? And I was like, ah, oh, photography, I guess. And and I just went from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's a gift in a way, right? I mean, because well, it's many photographers dream of working for National Geographic and doing all the things that you described. So for you having those dreams, were there ever any doubts around that? You know, it's just like you mentioned being competitive, but you know, I feel like sometimes when you're aiming for the, to be the best of a best in a certain field, we unfortunately as humans or as individuals can talk ourselves out of it pretty easily. So we can be like, well, who am I to, you know, did you ever any, deal with any of that self doubt kind of stuff? Yeah, you? yeah, all the time. As a photographer, especially, I don't know if it's a photographer in general or if it's in my field of photography, um, there's always someone that's going to be better than you. And I guess it's the same with anything you do in your life, right? So for me, being that competitive self, it's kind of like I self judge myself all the time to see if my work is good enough. And I work off like intrinsic value. So if if I feel like the work is good, then it's okay. But if someone tells me that the work is good, I don't really value that opinion because I know if it's good or not, you know, in my own way. Um, so I'm always criticizing my own work and, um, and moving on. So there was always, there was moments throughout my career where I just thought, I'm not good enough as a photographer. Like, I'm just going to quit. And there, there's been multiple moments of that in my life. And it's kind of like, no, just, just keep going. Just keep pushing through. Just keep doing it. And then eventually... Um, it's kind of, you know, pulled up and, you know, I even get moments like that now sometimes where I'm like, ah, is, am I going to achieve what I really want? Or do I just like go for something else a little bit, you know? Um, so yeah, it's always been, I guess the devil on my shoulder of like, you're not good enough. You're not, you're not, not going to make it, you know, all of that, but you just kind of have to push through it and just, you know, learn from it and use it as a tool rather than something that's just going to push you down, you know? The tool of 
valuing the work, whatever work it is to somebody listening and they have their own version of work, whether it's photography or something else, right? And making that sort of your own standard and not letting other people validate what it is. Easier said than done, but also the right approach, I feel. And especially when you're learning a craft, it's you're not going to be that good in the beginning. That's always a balance too. How do you how do you judge the work without judging yourself? And how do you get past that point where it, it just starts getting better? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I guess I, I, I don't really know. I can't really pinpoint the moment, but I guess when you're first starting out, I would always compare my work to peers. And I knew there was another class above me, which was the professional, you know, the professional wildlife photographers that I looked up to and saw. But I knew how they were creating the work, but I just couldn't do it physically myself. Um, but that's like step one of like knowing how they're doing it. And then I just like took a lot of time of just being like, okay, this is how they're doing it. Let me try and practice that. Let me try and do it. So we used to spend hours and stuff making up our own makeshift hide with like camo netting and logs or trees, or whatever it might be, um, look alongside a river and just wait for animals to come and use our knowledge and, and learn a lot about the wildlife itself, you know, rather than like the skill of a camera, because that's, you know, you want to learn, you want to put yourself in the best position possible, especially when it comes to wildlife photography. You want to be, you want to know everything about that animal before going into the field. Because when you're in the field, then you, you're hearing the sound of the call or you're hearing what, or you know what time of day it's going to come and feed or whatever it might be. You, you're already prepared. And then you just have to wait for that moment. And then you could be waiting for hours and hours and then suddenly it arrives and it's gone within a couple of minutes. And you want to make sure you really take advantage of all of that and all of that moment. So I guess, I don't know, I, I don't really remember a moment of, oh, I'm not good enough. Um, you know, I was always comparing to my work to the peers at the time. And then when I turned, when I graduated, I was like, oh, I guess I'm a professional. Okay, let's look at the professionals and where do I want to be? I actually went into, when I asked it after university to make some money, I went into uh, wedding photography. And it's funny because before university, People were not my thing. Like I, I did not want to. That's why I went and did like a wildlife <laughs> landscape course. You just said people aren't my thing. Yeah, I was just like, I don't <laughs> want to photograph any. I don't like portraits. I didn't like fashion, studio photography, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so doing wedding photography, I was like, nah, I don't really like it. But then my compet- competitive self came out, and I was like, I actually kind of like this. Like it's hard work, it's long days, and you can't miss that moment. So I adapted the skills of wildlife where when moments happen in specific moments of a wedding where you have to capture that, like the kiss or whatever it might be. And so I was used to using those kind of skills I had to then go into wedding photography. And over those years I was there, it, I was I was actually learning how to tell a story and it was like photojournalism in that way. So that was also another t- a tool that I used to then bring back years later when I went into the Amazon to be like, okay, here's people, here's what they're doing, here's their culture, I'm just going to document what they're doing. Whereas, it, you know, before that, it was only just like wildlife or a nice, pretty landscape, you know? So it's putting everything into perspective. I'm excited to get to that part of, you know, where you're on, what you're doing, because I have a lot of questions around that. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to share one thing that maybe will be helpful to somebody listening. I know there's, there's been times when I've been stuck uh, creatively or on, on a project. And, you know, even if I wasn't at the professional level yet and, and, for me, sometimes it's easy to just never feel like I'm at that professional level with anything, you know. But uh, I would ask myself the question, what what would a professional do here? And then I felt like that at least gave me a direction. Even if I couldn't produce something at what I believed was a professional level, at least by asking the question, it could inform my decisions around the work, which, I, you know, was super helpful. So uh, for me anyway, or has been at times. So I just, I just wanted to share that. For me, with that, I guess for me, if I have that block and it's a creative block in my field, right? So if I'm getting that creative block, the best thing I can do is try and go outside, try and go for a walk, try and listen to podcasts, try and just get motivational inspiration from somewhere else because you're hearing, for me, it really helps for to hear other people. It doesn't have to be about photography. It can be about anything that I'm interested in, but it's like taking your mind somewhere else and like developing your mind in another way, which will then influence the creativity much later. Um, I do a lot of meditation in these years and, and that I find that really helps me. Um, you know, so it's always been like, there's other methods that I would do um, to stop that creativity 
um, or create the creativity flow. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Sometimes I uh, want to kick myself when I haven't been outside all day and, and I feel stuck and I realize, well, as soon as I take a walk, all this stuff just frees up. Whatever block, if you want to visualize an actual block, it's just like explodes into a thousand pieces and everything comes through again. And just like, yeah, there's just like a little, little voice that comes in. It's just like, ping, here's an idea. Ah, oh, and then you just start expanding from the idea, you know, just allowing the space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, it looks like you're still doing some work with the ayahuasca retreat. I wanted to kind of talk about that because that looks like, at least based on your timeline, it seems like that was something that you got into fairly early on when you got to Ecuador. I'm not sure. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And are you still involved? Is that Have you done ayahuasca? You've documented the experience? Like, I want to kind of dig into this a bit. into it yeah yeah sure so um when i arrived i arrived into ecuador 2019 as a, as a time scale stamp um and then so i had the year of like trying to get known and all that kind of stuff um but also trying to learn the language because i realized wow this is actually pretty difficult i can't get anywhere people that in south america don't well People do speak English, but it's not common that people will speak English here in Ecuador. So I just had to learn Spanish. So when I, was, I took the first year trying to do that, and then 2020 came, pandemic, boom, obviously everything closed. Because that was then going to be my year of like, yeah, everything planned, got all these jobs lined up, blah, blah, blah. And then from 2020, one of my first jobs off the back of the pandemic, which was around August, shall I say, it was when things started opening up a little bit here. Um, and... One of those jobs was an ayahuasca retreat. And um, as it goes is that I sent them a message, which I don't remember doing, but when I was first arrived saying, hey, like I'm a photographer, I'd love to come and learn more about the ayahuasca and everything else, like everything you do. Well, wh why did you um, do that? What, what interests you? Um, I had never heard of it before, before I went traveling to South America in 2017. Um, but one of my friends told me like, oh, like before leaving, it's like, oh, you're going to do ayahuasca? I'm like, I don't know what that is. No idea what that is. Um, so, so it kind of like pinged in my mind in that moment. And then when, once I'd arrived into Ecuador, it was kind of like this thing that I heard a little bit about, but I was just curious because it came from like an indigenous culture that I didn't really know anything about. And that was like a part of it. Um, so then I just was like, okay, how can I help? And this was like an ayahuasca retreat. So it was like an influx of tourism coming in. I learned a little bit of Spanish. Well, I'd learned enough actually by 2020. And so I was kind of that link of bilingual and photography at the same time. Um, so I thought that's like a skill I can have. And also I live in Ecuador. I'm not just like a random person traveling through. Um, so when I, I sent them a message when I first arrived, I guess, and I don't remember it, but I don't think I got a response. But then in August, 2020, they were, the person was just like, Hey, like we're really, we're looking for, for a photographer. Um, our normal photographer is like hurt his leg or broke his leg or something. Are you able to come in like tomorrow or like in two days or something? I was like, oh God, like I'm on the coast and it took, it takes like an overnight bus ride to get uh, to the capital. And then from there, it was like a five hour journey. So I thought, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'll just go, I'll, I'll leave it. And like, I hadn't, didn't have any work or anything. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do it. So I started working with those guys for, um, throughout the year, really throughout different retreats and stuff. And I learned like, yeah, like how they were. And then, and then at the same time, because they were an ayahuasca retreat, but then so suited for tourism. And then at the same time, I was doing other jobs in other places in different communities that weren't touristic at all. So um, I was learning about how they perceive ayahuasca rather than the Western world, because obviously the Western world, we, some, some people might perceive it to be like a, like, like a, another drug, like an experience to take is like for leisure, right? Um, but absolutely, actually it has like a much deeper meaning to it. It's more spiritual and it's more, you have more of a connection and actually heals you rather than like taking just a normal drug that we would consider in the Western world, you know? I'm trying to put myself in your shoes, somebody that didn't really, you know, know that much about it. You heard about it when you got there and now all of a sudden you take this bus and, and you're at this place and you probably educated yourself a bit at that point, but you documented the experience, I guess. So that's what you were doing. What was that like the first time? I mean, yeah, it was the first time you ever witnessed any of that stuff. At some point, I'm curious if you partook in a in a ceremony or anything like that. But yeah, just just the initial 
kind of experience that you were witnessing as somebody who is is documenting something what what were your impressions yeah so um when i first arrived it, it was kind of like i i understood what kind of kind of what it was but i was never interested in taking it i was just more interested in just documenting it and seeing more of the culture learning everything you know another thing about the jungle i guess and when i went there because i had been doing it over like multiple times just documenting it and i should say actually um i wasn't documenting the actual so I documented it up to a certain point because it becomes a very spiritual process and the camera shouldn't be involved beyond a certain point. So uh, the trip was like a three-day trip. You get there, you arrive, you do some hikes, you go to waterfalls, you learn about the different plants, the med- medicinal plants in the forest, and you start picking things and eating it and trying it, and you realize that that's their pharmacy, right, um, just there in the forest. So like it, it was like amazing to have that first first experience of being like, wow, I'm like, I'm actually in the wild, like I'm, I'm here with these guys and um, he's an indigenous shaman. Uh, he was vegetarian, but living in the wild, he was diabetic, but only took a berry a day just to he, like cure himself with the insulin. It had enough insulin inside that one berry each day. So I was just amazed at how like these guys were living with their pharmacy in the forest there, but we've been taught to, you know, to take a pill or do like inject themselves with insulin or whatever it might be for us. So I, it was really interesting to see that clash and what's beneficial and what's not um so i would document it by doing that whole experience of like going through the jungle etc and then on the day of the ayahuasca or the the nights of the ayahuasca um i would document the the taking of it so um the the shaman would be sat there he would do you know his portion size he would look at you assess you and see uh what portion size you want and then you would then take uh, the sitting and then you would go sit down back in your seat and you just then guess I you just what perceived to be was just they would just sit there and just be there for hours and just sit there everything was very very quiet um, and then and then after like a certain amount of time people might end up throwing up or whatever it might be um, and also at that period when it was my first thing the the guy was Chilean the one of the the what's the words like one of the guys that ran it, like one of the organizers, I should say, I guess, um, he, he was Chilean. So I couldn't really, his accent's super strong in Spanish. So I couldn't really understand him. So I wasn't learning much about sitting or the preparation or anything like that. I was just seeing what I could, you know, just seeing what was happening in front of me. And as a photographer, that's just a skill that I've just learned to have and just seeing what's going on. And so people just then sit back on their, their seat and they just sit there and then eventually people might start throwing up or whatever or move their hands around or do these different things but um because I wasn't under the influence and I didn't I I didn't really know what was going on but at that point it's like pitch black no lights are on um because when you take ayahuasca all your senses are heightened so any form of light that comes in is like super strong for you so you so during a ceremony it's just like pitch black and obviously for a photographer that's like the nightmare like you can't use flash you can't do anything so in terms of like the taking of the ceremony when you start ingesting it um i was using candlelight um so it wasn't as strong but i just placed the candles in a certain way to allow me to illuminate their face and the shaman or whatever it might be and really push the settings in the camera um and then one of your questions was if i've taken it if i've taken it before and uh, i have but it took me a, quite a while to to actually wait for that moment because i after speaking to the indigenous people they were talking to me like um like you don't take ayahuasca ayahuasca calls you so i was kind of waiting for that moment where i was like ah like I don't know, like, it's interesting. I like the idea, but is it dangerous? Like, I had these, like, doubts on taking it and all that kind of thing. Like, do I need to take it? Because I know it's a medicine. It's not just a recreational drug. So, I like, I never really had that calling, really, until, like, a few years later um, when I was I was offered to, to have it. So I've, I've, I've had it twice, actually. Um, but it's kind of really interesting because, and it's kind of, I don't know, for me, I've... I've definitely had like the experience of the ayahuasca and um, if anyone's consumed DMT, it's kind of, it is a DMT drug. So to have ayahuasca, you have the vine, which needs to be mixed with um, a leaf and that leaf acts as the catalyst to, to allow the 
hallucinations and everything else. Um, so in indigenous culture, ayahuasca is very much like a, a medicine to allow you to communicate through the earth. So it's kind of like the earth's consciousness comes through the ayahuasca vine. Um, so it's incredibly powerful. It can like heal like many, many um, mental illnesses or whatever you might do. So in, in indigenous culture, it's very much um, if you have a, a teenager, for example, or a child that isn't, you know, isn't, I um, can't remember the word in English now, isn't look like, uh, who's a bit of a brat, who isn't behaving well and isn't like, you know, good in their own community. The shaman might take them aside. They have different ceremonies they might do, but one of them might be an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, and then that will, they'll go through the ceremony where the shaman is there and uh, communicating through them in the spiritual world and everything else and then curing them. And then eventually that, that child might be clear from all the negative energy and then just be absolutely fine afterwards. So it was just fascinating to learn like the stories of like how things work and the realm of the spiritual realm of, of, shamanism really um i because i couldn't comprehend how it worked i i'd grown up i was an atheist i um, never went to church I, so i never really had a ceremony of any kind so i wasn't really i never had like a spiritual belief until you know a few years ago when i it just kind of clicked to me and it was kind of like wow like this is a whole new world and i was it just became open um because before all of that i was hearing these stories and i was like oh that's cool that you believe that but you know, I don't believe that. I believe in science and I believe in everything else. Um, and I can't be physically possible, but it's just your imagination or whatever. But actually, these guys, over the years, it's kind of like I've been learning more and more about their their culture and um, in the spiritual world. And it's kind of like, just kind of clicked for me. and be like, wow, like, this stuff is real. Like, the, the way they the way they drive the whole of the ceremony and the things that they do, it perceives like someone's maybe just singing or if they're like waving the leaves around and doing whatever or drumming whatever it might be but all of those things have like a a, me a deeper meaning behind it um so it's super super interesting to, to be inside of a ceremony and then obviously if you're under the influence as well it's like work it's like hard work like you're going deep inside of your like your shadow um we like to call it like shadow work right so it's kind of like things that you don't want to see pop up things that you don't want to you know, you're pushing down, you don't want to come to light. Um, that's what comes up. Ayahuasca just rips that out of you and it's like, this is what it is. This is your problem. Deal with it. And it, it can be through uh, visualization. It can be through feelings. It can be through like, I don't know, just kind of touch, sound, anything. But it, it's whatever sensation you might have, um, it, it goes through the process of healing you over the course of the night of six to eight hours or however long it is. When it clicked for you in terms of spirituality, was it due to the ceremony, the first ceremony, or was it before that? And then it was before that. It was okay. before that. So it was yeah, kind so of you like were a... just getting exposed to these ideas and and being receptive, and then yeah, you had these experiences. Well, what what did you learn from the experience personally? If you can share anything. I, I know it sounds like there were probably some personal things involved, but uh, I mean, share what, what you will here. I'm just curious of what, what the actual experience was like and what you took away from it. So for me, it was, kind of, it was very interesting because I, I witnessed like the, the, the patterns, the geometric patterns and stuff and um, all of that moving. But like the th biggest takeaway that I got was very much like a connection to nature, uh, like a connection to the elements whether that might be the fire that's going on in front of you or the, the air around you, um, water or earth. Um, I felt very much connected to it. So I could like not communicate, but feel its presence is probably better to say. Um, so I think that's the biggest takeaway that I got from it. In terms of like visualizations, hallucinations, all of that kind of thing, it wasn't too strong for me. There was like a presence of someone being there. So when I first took ayahuasca, it was kind of like, it was kind of like I closed my eyes, I was meditating, and then a voice told me, open your eyes. But it wasn't me. It was very, very strange. It wasn't me, like my mind telling me to open my eyes. It, it felt like a, it was a woman's voice. So ayahuasca, they say, has like a, a grandmother spirit. So it was like a woman's grandmother telling me, like, open the eyes. Um, so I was like, wow, like that's, that was like super strong. Like, open your eyes. So like, okay, okay. So I'll just sit here and open my eyes, like waiting for things to happen all of this kind of thing. And then I just started feeling like a connection with the fire that was in front of me and like, yeah, and all of that kind of stuff. 
And then, which is very interesting because over my the years of learning, I, I realized that obviously through photography as well, but I'm just a very visual person. The way I think and the way I see things is very much like a film. Like if I'm if I'm in a dream, it is very much like film production. Like there's a you know a drone in the air doing aerial shots with close ups and all this kind of thing. And I, I'm like taking all of that in. It's just how I perceive my my world. Um, so when I took ayahuasca, it wasn't actually that visual, which was a big surprise for me. Um, so I just felt like a presence, and I had this verbal communication with someone that obviously in my mind wasn't really real but I just like went with it um the second time it was again very similar I thought I'll take it the second time to see if I go a bit deeper and everything else um and it was very similar in that in that respect um which was really interesting because even just from breath work or meditation I can go I've been a lot deeper than I have through ayahuasca which I don't think I've heard anyone ever say before um because it is a super powerful um uh, medicine but um, for me personally, it didn't really affect me the way I thought. So maybe I'll take it a third time and then uh, and see and to see how it, how it goes. But also, ayahuasca isn't a thing to be taken just once. It's it's a thing to be taken throughout your life um, as a way to kind of reset you and uh, to help clear all of those. You know, we'll talk about creative block and everything else. Just clear all of that 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 mess inside of your mind. Um, and let you perceive and just love again, you know? Um, so it helps a lot, a lot of people that uh, suffer with mental illnesses and everything. It really helps them. Um, but I, I hadn't suffered with any of that. So I never felt like it was right until that moment when I, it was offered to me and everything just kind of went into place. And I felt like it called me. On your website, I know you consider yourself uh, an environmentalist, activist, conservationist, and that's the the work that you're aligned with and what you're doing. And before uh, I'm going to ask you about bio corridors and what specifically is going on and what what can be done and that sort of thing, but just on conservation and activism and 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 that. I mean, I do believe that obviously the more people that are involved in that sort of thing and doing it the right way is helpful <laughs> to the planet because we need to have people championing certain causes, again, doing it the right way. And then I can ask you about what that means as well. A lot of people that may be attracted to that sort of thing also might at the same time write it off because on the surface, it doesn't seem like, well, okay, I have to provide for my family. Like I have to, you know, actually earn a living. How can I earn a living from being environmentalist and activist? And so therefore it gets, it gets written off. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just here to explore maybe some of the myths and the truths around that that you've had in your experience and what it looks like to kind of make that your core mission, but still having to sort of earn a living and, you know, having money to live and eat and all that stuff is the reality of the world we live in. I'm asking this question for anybody listening that has maybe had these thoughts or considered them and yet they have their travel dreams and maybe they do want to own a house sometime and stuff like that. Like, again, you can, I think you can have your cake and eat it too. I'm just curious through your experience, what that, looks like any advice you have that sort of thing yeah i think there's like a calculation of planning where to begin you definitely need to have money saved the beauty of living here in ecuador means that i'm not flying out to go to the amazon jungle every time i have a job um so that was something that i had really strong in me that if i'm going to the amazon i need to immerse myself completely i need to get to ecuador i need to learn spanish and i just need to go here and then travel by public bus to get there um, um i couldn't fathom like flying out to do a trip every other job you know throughout the year multiple flights because obviously that's just you know it doesn't work because if i'm trying to protect an environment and then one of the biggest impacts of the environment is air travel like it just would not work um, so that's one thing uh, that I really wanted to do. So I went and lived in Ecuador. And one of the beauties of living here in Ecuador is like the cost of living is pretty cheap. Um, so I was able to work with, for example, um, NGOs and foundations and things like that that have a, a wage that's from outside of Ecuador, uh, whether that be the US or Europe. And But then it means that I would work less when I'm here in Ecuador because I'm getting paid more in terms of the cost of living here. So obviously we're, we're, we're assessing our situation of the cost of living. Where I'm from, it, the island is 
is a very much a finance finance island. So everyone, all my friends would work and move into the finance industry and just make money that way. Obviously, a lot of money is being made there, but for me, it just wasn't for me at all. Like I couldn't just sit behind a desk nine till five and just input numbers, or whatever it is, you know. So I really wanted to push my passion, um, which was the environment conservation through photography or media. Um, so I put myself here in the deep end, I guess. Moved to Ecuador. I eliminated that 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 travel thing. Um, but before that, I needed to save money. I needed to have like some form of money there. For me, if nothing worked out, like at least I was able to live off my savings for a bit. Um, so that's definitely something that if someone's looking to go out and do something, obviously it doesn't have to be photography, but anything like go travel or like do something. There's there's different ways to travel. There's ways, you know, you can do it for way cheaper than uh, what we perceive to be, for example, if you go on work away or couch surfing or whatever it might be, you can do different things for free. You can work for people for free, um, um, in in exchange for your accommodation and your food. So actually, you're just getting all the experience. So that's what I did in my first year was moved around um, by land transport because that was the best form in terms of the environment, and then from there just worked with different people, but for free because I had the savings up. So, like, if I wanted to have this expense to, like, go whatever it might be, um, skydiving or whatever it is, I don't know, um, any kind of excursion, like, I had that money saved there. But, like, in the whole terms of thing, like, the whole long-term plan, it was, like, yeah, do things for free. And then also I'm with people in that culture and learning from them as well. What is a bio corridor? Why is it important? That backstory, that's with an NGO. Um, and so bio corridor is effectively just the a corridor that's preserved um, for wildlife to pass through. So, like, I'm sure you're aware there's so many, almost all the animals will migrate um, to different places, you know, to get around the world. Um, but unfortunately, with our development in our world of cities and roads and everything else, that acts as a barrier. So there's like a, I can't remember how, I think it's like a 2,000 mile wide development barrier where wildlife can't migrate. So in terms of the the global system, the Amazon heats up and the Andes cool down every 5,000 years or so. Um, and we're in that movement of change of the Amazon heating up and the Amazon, uh, the Amazon changing as well. Um, sorry, the Andes are changing as well. So when the Amazon heats up, the animals migrate to higher ground up to the Andes. So... Not many people also know, I should also say that um, the Andes, the Andean mountains and the Amazon are connected. They, they have different ecosystems along the way through the altitude and everything, but it's all connected. But when humans came and settled, we built roads and we built cities. And those cities seem to be in farms and everything else. Those seem to be perfectly placed, just a little bit lower on the Andes side. So it's kind of in between the Amazon and the Andes is where we do it. But obviously for migrating animals in times like now where the Amazon is heating up, they can't migrate anymore because they're, they're going across roads, they're crossing farms, which are just absolute, like for them, it's just a barrier. Like obviously we might say, oh, they can just cross through that field. But for them, they can't because they don't feel safe because of predators or whatever it is. Um, so the work that um, this NGO has been doing is creating this bio corridor from um, Yasuni, which is, which is a national park in uh, the Amazon, which is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet, um, all the way to a spot in the Andes. And, and along the way, you have nationalities, um, indigenous nationalities of their own territories. So we've been talking to different nationalities along the way um, to help give them an idea on how to conserve um, and obviously it's all up to them and their idea, it's their land, but we're just kind of teaching them the Amazon's heating up and animals don't have anywhere to go. So maybe just allow like a 2K kilometre here or whatever you might have, whatever space you might have on the riverside here to allow them to cross and maybe have a certain spot here where you don't hunt, but hunt somewhere else. So you're allowing like a, a intangible zone where no one can go in you have another zone where people can go and hunt, but no one can live. And then you have another zone where it's like building up your settlements and um, all your communities. So it's kind of like doing that all the way up until the Andes uh, to allow this bio corridor for the wild wildlife to freely migrate up and down. Um, so it's actually something that no one's talking about. 
Um, but it's incredibly important because obviously without the animals being there, that whole circle of life is not, isn't, isn't working. The, like the insects won't be there anymore to pollinate the plants of the Amazon, which is, you know, it's like 25% of oxygen in our planet. So we really need to conserve the Amazon, but we don't really know how we're doing it correctly. And instead, like what we're doing and um, at the moment is kind of working on pockets of places and not looking at the grand scheme of things. Because even if you went in Google Earth right now and you type, you just went into the map, South America, and you looked at the Amazon, you see it's all green. And then you look at the mountains and it's kind of like a different shade. And then from, if you zoom a bit further in, it's just like, like roads and farms and everything all the way up from, from down to Bolivia or Peru, all the way up to Venezuela. So that whole section of the Amazon is just being closed off. So it's not even in Ecuador that's happening. This is happening across the whole of the Amazon. And in Brazil, it's even worse. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really good project to be to be involved with. Um, and I absolutely love the work doing with it. Um, but we also, at the same time, it's difficult because, because we can't be specific about the areas or be specific about what work we're doing. Even the information I've given out now is quite, quite a lot because um, once – someone hears it in the wrong like once someone hears it could be the oil giants or people that want to you know to put in a petrol zone or mine or anything like that they have so much power through their money they can't they're just going to change it they have like the government under their finger so they'll just be like here throw money at it let me go into that zone so there's a constant battle now in the amazon where you have indigenous people fighting for the rights of their land but oil giants are coming in and just infiltrating the land and then digging it up, polluting the rivers, and then, you know, these indigenous people are just left there. Um, so it's like a real fight. So I think this project that they're, they're doing is like, it's amazing because it's allowing this freely, free, not only the freely moving of um, the wildlife, but it's also connecting different nationalities of different territories where in ancestral times they used to fight for their territories in the Amazon. But now they're you know, unionizing is one to then fight the ex- external force, you know? Mm. How, how does the average person find out more information, get involved if they want? Yeah, there's a, there's a website, which is Andy's or I think it's AAC.org. Um, let me just double check it just to make sure. Um, there is a website where uh, if you wanted to be involved, you can help. Um, aaconserve.org aaconserve.org that's the one okay yeah yeah we can link to that things that actually really help is getting involved with communities themselves also because also you don't if you donate to an ngo like it might be difficult to know where that money is going depending on the ngo or you might not trust it for whatever things history you might have with them um not to say that ngos are bad or anything like that but something that is really good is actually going to the amazon yourself witnessing witnessing what's happening and speaking to the locals there um and because there's a lot of indigenous communities now that are opening up to tourism and they know that's the new way um so they're they're opening up they're, they're getting their beds with mosquito nets and all that kind of stuff and and just opening up for tourism but the thing is with them is obviously because they come from the rainforest their integration into the Western world with technology is so difficult for them. So uh, you see now there's a few influences, if you like, um, quote unquote, but um, there's so many people in the Amazon, the rainforest that ha- like really mean good. They just want to conserve their land. They want to raise awareness for it all by doing that. And if you actually go and visit the Amazon and go and stay in one of these communities, you're helping pay for their medicine or their education to send them to the city to learn or whatever it might be. So actually I would always recommend to try and give you money directly to them. Um, but also if you don't have that opportunity, then NGOs are always, always the best bet as well, like to donate their money, you know, that ain't your money cool. to them. Yeah. And I may have to ask about doing it the right way and something we mentioned, whether you are somebody on the ground like yourself who's getting involved with an organization. Perhaps you're a traveler passing through that wants to do something to help out. Perhaps you're somebody that's uh, just at home and you'd like to support different causes. You know, this this concept of uh, the white savior complex, and I'm only bringing this up because we're two white guys talking here. 
this idea, and I'm just going to read the definition from health.com in case somebody's not familiar with this, is this ideology that is acted upon when a white person from a position of superiority attempts to help or rescue a BIPOC person or community, whether this is done consciously or unconsciously, people with this complex have the underlying belief that they know best or that they have skills that BIPOC people don't have. Uh, end quote. And that's just the sort of the definition of what that means. This isn't like an accusation. I'm not picking or anything. I, I'm bringing this up because I want to know your advice around, you know, being involved in something like this. What is sort of the best way to do this where you're actually working alongside the indigenous people and making sure that that relationship is where it's supposed to be and, and, and that it's how it's supposed to be. And, you know, how do we make sure that an organization is doing that, that we want to support. It's complicated. There's not necessarily a way to know, but, you know, this is an important conversation to have as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, I'm British, I'm completely white, going into the rainforest. um, That's got to be one kind of view that people are putting on me, you know, as a white, white boy coming in and just like, you know, telling us what to do or whatever. So the way around that, I guess, like you say, it's very, very complicated. Um, for me, it's very much, okay, tell me what you want to hear. Like, what's your voice? What do you want to share? So I'm kind of that medium of using my work to help share their story. Um, so that's the way in which I, I do things. It happens a lot with NGOs where they'll go in thinking they know best, oh, we got to conserve, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the indigenous people are there where like their, their forest is like intact. They've been conserving it, been there for thousands of years and they've just been living how, how they always lived. And then you have some white guy coming in and it's just like, Oh no, you need to conserve this. You need to do this, that and the other. And you're like, well, what do you know? You're like, you, you don't even live in the Amazon or whatever it is, you know? Um, so it is a really important thing to, to approach. Um, that's why I would always recommend going through like a tourism indigenous community where they're aware of you're supporting them directly rather than going through an NGO. The NGO that I was talking about earlier, uh, the work that we do in the, each territory, they they have full decision on what happens. We just implement some things like maybe a bit of guidance and say, this is what would happen in the long run. But obviously, this is your land. You do as you will. You don't have to create this corridor of a two mile, uh, two kilometer stretch on this river and serve it. Just do whatever you can to help this wildlife come through. And then with that, you you will get more wildlife to hunt. You know, so it's it's like a win win. So it, it's very particular in the way you would word it to some pe- to some communities. There are other communities that just say no, which I don't blame at all because you don't want anyone coming in. There was one quote that I heard when I went into a community one time and it was uh, one guy that was against it and he said, we aren't whales. Once once there was a, uh, an NGO that wanted to come in and track their movement uh, through the jungle and see how far they walked in a, in a day or whatever it might be, any sort of research behind them. Um, and he he's it's obviously gone into his mind so deeply he's, he's thought about it this whole time um so his example that he gave he said we're not whales we aren't here to be tracked we, we're just here living in our land we're just doing what we what we do and we can serve you know because for them they they live on the world through the spiritual realm as well as the physical realm um so like the trees for example hold stories and ancestors and they alleviate this this uh the spirits around the rainforest and and they, they live in harmony with that and when someone comes in and starts chopping it down it's completely you know disrupts it completely um so they so for them they would prefer that no one comes in and just leaves them untouched so those are very much that is it's really particular in the way you word things to them and let them know but i i i do worry about that for sure 100% because I don't want to go in there and tell them like what I think is right and what's not. I would, I, for me, the way I get around it is just going in and documenting what they have and saying, look, I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to give you this platform and just like document what you have. And then if you have the social media, I can give you that content. So then you can boost your social media to, to then, you know, promote your own voice to the world. So it's kind of a, giving them content in the same way. Cool. You've spent time with various indigenous people in um, Peru, I'm assuming Ecuador, Bolivia as well. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a bit about some of the people you've met, what you've learned from them. Yeah, yeah. So um, I my first ever trip into the Amazon was in Peru. Um, and it was with an Ashaninka community um, that can and I found them through 
I think it was Workaway or something like that, Couchsurfing or one of them. I can't remember one of the sites, but I found them through there where they were offering offering this thing, sustainable tourism, et cetera, come in. Um, you give them some money, you help build houses for them, you know, chop bamboo or whatever it might be to help them build a house. And that was an amazing experience to do. I stayed there for two weeks. Um, if anyone's looking to do that kind of thing but doesn't know how to come in, obviously they can always just send me a message because I have a lot of contacts through that. But um, they can also just go on work away or whatever it is and just type in like i don't know amazon indigenous retreat or amazon community it's better like i i try and stay away from the tribe although a tribe is like a key word um when you speak to people in these indigenous communities they don't like the the connotation that gives it's like a ne- negative connotation it, it treats them as if they're like wild and savage people you know but they're just like normal people like us and they just live in their own communities so the correct wording would be indigenous communities for sure um so i would just search indigenous community in the amazon or something on any sort of website that's travel based the way you can stay and that'll be step one for sure um another trip i did was in the Boli- in bolivia as well that was the second one bolivia that that was more of a tourism thing i was traveling um, and I just wanted to see how Bolivia was. That was amazing also. Um, I went to a place, I think it's called Renabeque, something like that, and that's like where you fly into, and then you can get, you know, you get a bus from there or you get canoe, whatever it is, from there. Um, and that was amazing for its wildlife, and uh, I managed to swim with pink river dolphins and all that kind of stuff, and uh, that was incredible. That was amazing. Um, one thing you might not get when you go and visit an indigenous community is the wildlife because obviously they're they're living in that space so the wildlife tends to stay away so when they go hunting for example they'll go they'll go further down river go in a spot where there's a hunting spot where they go and find the, the wildlife um or like a salt lick or something like that um so you kind of it's hard to get both of them it's hard to live the indigenous community life as well as find all the amazing wildlife um you kind of want to you want to prioritize which one you want most. Um, not to say that you can spend a few days in one community and then go to another where it's very small and not much impact has happened there. So there is a lot more wildlife. That can also happen as well. Um, and then Ecuador is my my fuerte, my strength, I guess. Um, I've spent, I've, I've traveled to many, many indigenous communities in, in the Amazon in Ecuador. Um, and... Um, it's just amazing to see the different different ones, the different territories, different nationalities, and um, how they kind of work together. Some of them are very similar, some of them aren't so similar um, in their ways. For example, in Ecuador, you have a nationality which will be the Shwa or Achwa, uh, which are two different ones, and they they have a more of a mindset of like I'm a warrior, I'm you know strong, and I'm fight to that kind of thing. But then you'll move into like other communities a bit further north and there were like, for example, the Sapara or the Shuyad, and they, um, they're more like lovers and protectors of the land. So it's, it's really interesting to see like the differences between the different communities as well or the different nationalities. And then inside of that, you have different communities around on different rivers and, and all of that as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, you know, if you want to get connected directly with indigenous communities and to you you were saying earlier that basically your some of your best ways to, to support them is is if you're traveling through spending some of your money in, in these communities so doing like a simple google search or sort of finding these opportunities to connect directly is a good way to support uh, some of these communities and and i guess traveling and having experiences in indigenous communities is, is that is that accurate as general sort of travel advice? Yeah, you can definitely do that for sure. If you want to go off the beaten path, which is always what I strive to do. I didn't want to do like tourist driven tourism. If right, like a sense. group comes in and they, you know, yeah, have lunch and it's or whatever, a constant and influx of people coming in and out and like doing these things. Um, cause, cause a lot of places in, in the Amazon rainforest, there's a lot of lodges. And there are often people that are outsiders that have gone and bought the land and created a lodge and then they know how to work tourism so that your stay will be very, very comfortable and very good and they'll be in a good spot for wildlife or whatever it might be. Um, but also it might not be as genuine as you think. So the best way really is to get involved in an indigenous community for sure. Um, 
unfortunately for me, I have been that kind of person which I, I would allow, I'll bring people in into a certain community. They will describe to me what they might want, if they want more wildlife, if they want more indigenous community, or if they want a ceremony specifically, or whatever it might be. Um, I'm, I, I like to be that middleman where I can invite people into different communities that I've come to know through working there for over four years, you know. Um, but if someone is choosing, for example, another place like Brazil or whatever, then a simple Google search would help. But just know that if there is like an Amazon Eco Lodge or something, the experience will be amazing. It will be expensive, but you might not, that money probably isn't going to the indigenous community that's there. Um, so it's something to be conscious of and maybe even to ask the lodge how much money goes back into the community or is there any integration with an indigenous community, et cetera, you know, rather than, cause sometimes with that moment, I feel like you're then treating them like a zoo where you're going there to visit them and you're, you're not really helping out or you're, you know, it's a weird way you come observing them and looking at them. So it's like a weird psychology when you in and go into an eco lodge, they'll take you for the morning or for the day and to go and visit a community, but then the community kind of there and they, they've, you know, they're just kind of, being themselves but everyone's there slapping photos in their face and whatever so there's definitely ways to do it correctly um and for me i think it's spending time with them getting to know them and then like obviously getting the photos and things because they like photos they like all of that stuff but obviously not when it happens with no exchange of a relationship or only here just to get a quick photo and go for my instagram you know that kind of thing so it's the way in which you approach the situation you're a photographer that has taken many pictures of people and uh, yeah, what would be your advice there to the traveler? I mean, this can be general advice for any traveler that's looking to, you know, sometimes you just see people and they, something special about them. And I uh, you know, of course, a photo is a nice way to have a memory, but also it can be intrusive and it can um, interfere with the, with the connection and the interaction, but maybe it doesn't have to as well. It, obviously very circumstantial, but the reality is there are a lot of travelers out there. They might have an interaction and they may want to have a photo with somebody to just remember that interaction or they may want to capture a moment that, that strikes them. What is your advice on, on how best to do that? Yeah, it's very difficult, actually. Like if you took the genre of street photography, for example, that's very much that. Um, you're, you're going down the street and seeing people that you like in your city, like the look of or whatever, like aura they might give off and you want to get a photo of them and that's like the trick it's really difficult there's so many photographers um that don't know how to do that and it is very difficult to approach that subject um, because it's psychology it's not just exactly. technical photography it's, it's the way you approach right? uh -huh. yeah. you can't just come up like some some people's style is to go up and take a photo and like leave and it, it works in their way depending how they approach the situation others it's obviously very difficult so a lot of photographers are introverts so like that exchange of like trying to make yourself like, you know, like the way you are um, is very difficult for a lot of photographers. Um, so the way in which I personally do it is I assess the situation I've learned just to assess situations as how it comes and view it as a fly on the wall, uh, which I take through my photojournalism days or being a wedding photographer and not being the way, that kind of thing. But when I'm in a community, it's, um, it's very much I go in, I have the shots in my mind once I'm there, I'm formulating all the different ideas whilst I'm spending time with them and then when I choose the right moment to then approach them so I spend the obviously there's people that have time constraints and they can't do that but the way in which I do it is I try and spend as much time as I can even if it is a conversation with them for half an hour an hour or whatever to get to know them and say hey their story hear my story that kind of exchange and then after that be like oh do you mind if I just get a quick photo like I'm a photographer but I'll explain what you're doing um I can pass it on to you because some communities will have Wi-Fi. Some communities do have Instagram accounts, you know, all of these things. So you could try and explain in that way. Um, so for me, it's very much, yeah, I have shots planned. I'm assessing everything, going in, be like, oh, I really like that um, headdress they're wearing or I like the face paint, the, the face markings they have or whatever it is, the clothes they're wearing or the way that person looks, whatever you find the beauty in the situation. Um, I would then look for a, a, a like a place in the jungle, I would then be like, okay, that would be a really good spot to have as a nice backdrop or whatever it might be. Um, so when the moment comes where I'm speaking to them again, um, I'll be like, 
ah, oh, do you mind if we just get, take a quick photo over here? And then I'll just direct them over and be like, ah, oh, so you could just do this or do whatever or do what you were just doing or continue drinking your drink or eating your food, whatever it is that they're doing that you find that so amazing. Um, is do it, approach it that way. So they don't then feel very uncomfortable where you've just arrived and you're like, oh, can I get, get a quick photo? Can you just come over here and start directing them? At least they know a bit about you and they know what you're about and like, you know, they're comfortable around you. And also, if the, the p- person is comfortable with you, then is the photo is just going to come out so much better. I've taken many photos where I've done a similar thing, but there's just people that are camera shy. Like, you know, it's just natural. People are just camera shy, so you just know who to approach. So sometimes it might take like a couple of minutes when you approach someone. Sometimes it might take a couple of days or sometimes just never because it depends on the person. Um, so you will get sometimes where people, obviously it will show where they're very nervous or they're angry or whatever. They're not looking good. Um, and in that moment, I would take the photo, but then also may, then obviously not use it because I know they're not comfortable. Although there's not a verbal exchange, I just wouldn't use that photo because I, I know there's a feeling of un- un- uncomfortableness that they won't want that photo to go anywhere. Um, so, yeah, th- those would be my, my main things, really, that I would, I would do or advise. Do you want to share some of your favorite spots in Ecuador that travelers should visit? Yeah, it's interesting because Ecuador is um, a spot. Having done the, the Gringo Trail, if you like, from Argentina up to Colombia, um, people often do it from Central all the way down to Argentina as well. Um, having done that and I've visited different spots around the whole of Latin America, um, it's interesting because a lot of people skip Ecuador. I found that many people don't go to Ecuador, which is actually why I went, because everyone was skipping it. Um, and many people go only if they're going for the Galapagos. Um, and then if that attracts a certain kind of person, because the Galapagos, you need a lot of money to pay for the tours and all that kind of stuff. It's quite expensive, you know, to fly out there, etc. cetera. Um, so it attracts a different kind of person, which isn't me, really. I, I don't spend a lot of money on things. I like to do things off the beaten track, etc. So... Even entering Ecuador itself is great if you want something off the beaten path. Um, but I guess you could, if you're coming in, I would like the top tourist spots would be Cotopaxi National Park, which is a uh, Cotopaxi volcano. It's one of the highest active volcanoes in Ecuador. Um, and it went off just literally last month, I think. But it's um, it's amazing national park where it's just kind of this massive iconic volcano um, with like flat land all around it and then you can climb up some other inactive volcanoes to get a good view of Cotopaxi you can actually there are the other excursions to climb up Cotopaxi with ice picks and all that kind of stuff which I haven't done but that that must be an amazing experience um another one so Ecuador has like it's full of volcanoes you have like a volcano valley in the Andes so there's another one which is another volcano which has a lake inside of it like crystal turquoise blue water it's amazing and that's called Kilatoa and they have formed a, a loop around Kilatoa, which is like a three to four day hike, depending how quick you are and how long you want to take, um, which is also an amazing place to go, Kilatoa Loop. Uh, and you end on the, the volcano there. And they have like hostels and things like that where you can go and stay like, after the hike and then you can go and visit the volcano afterwards and look at it. You can even walk down to the water, that kind of thing. Uh, that's absolutely amazing. Um, Banyos is another great one for any traveler that, loves adventure for like river rafting or like zip lining or anything like that bungee jumping uh banyos is is a very good one for that um but it also has like a party scene as well so if you you are interested in the party scene as well they do have the bars and restaurants and that kind of thing uh which is really cool um on moving to the coast you have um you have montanita which is Montanita is kind of like a party town, so that attracts a certain type type of person, but it's also a surf spot. So if you are a surfer, then um, I would recommend there. But also, like Montanita is is like a place that is, it's only good if you're interested in partying. So it's like a a, a town that never sleeps. It's like full of clubs and all that kind of stuff. So if you you do want to surf, but you're not into the party scene, then I would recommend somewhere just along the side of it, which is a place called Olon. Um, O-L-O-M and, and there is like a, a 10 minute drive into Montanita you have the surfing there as well Ayampa is another spot along the coast there um, and then in the Amazon itself 
I mean, there's all these different communities. The Amazon itself has, I, I call them gateways into the Amazon and their cities. So you have places called Puyo, Coca, uh, Macas. Um, you have different cities that are situated from north all the way down to the south, the border of the Amazon. And those are indigenous cities where you can go in and then pick up a, a tour and then go in from there as well. Um, there's just so many things, and that's not even talking about the Galapagos. You know, there's so many different things. There's the the city retreats as well. You've got Quito, which has which is effectively Ecuador means the equator. So Ecuador is on the equator, and Ecuador is the middle middle of the world. They say. Uh, which is what Quito means in Quechua. Um, what so town Quito, are you in? I'm in Quito at the moment. Yeah, you are. Okay, yeah, but that's yeah. where you live. That's where I live. Yeah, in the mountains. So for me to get to the Amazon, it's only about five hours. Tell us about daily life there. I mean, you know, if somebody, I, I, I mean, somebody wants to move there, like, what does an apartment cost, or what, what's daily life yeah. look like? What do you eat? Yeah, I was just curious. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's amazing. The culture is. Is amazing. It's so different to what we would perceive. Um, so it's, it's interesting trying to come up, think of things when I've just become so used to the way of life now. But um, an apartment, for example, would cost, depending where you are, of course, here in Quito, depending where you are. Um, for example, me, I'm in a good spot um, and I only pay about $200 for the apartment a month. And that includes all the bills, all the Wi-Fi, um, you cook on gas, so all the gas and um, everything else. Um, just 200 straight off there. Um, but that can range to, I share the apartment as well with my friend. Um, you can pay maybe $350. You can also pay 850 for another place. You know, it depends on the scale, but you're paying rough. If you pay, if you have a budget for like a thousand a month, like you, you can live like a king. It's, um, it's amazing. But then other people will tell you, no, I, like I can barely afford that because it depends on people's spending requirements, you know. There's so many different quirks, I guess. So you have the markets and stuff. People put up stalls. A lot of people in South America are uh, entrepreneurs because they don't have any other option, but they have to work. So uh, the average salary a month is $400 a month here in Ecuador. Um, so if you think if I'm paying $200 a month in rent, that's half, and then you've got $200 for food and for your kids or whatever it might be. So it's very, very difficult. So you have a massive class difference of people that are rich and people that are just like super poor. Um, so, yeah, there's still, so you have a lot of people that are on the streets, unfortunately, from Venezuela. People migrate through into Colombia, Ecuador, Peru. And so you have a lot of Venezuelans living on the streets. So that's kind of like, that's a big part of the culture that is unfortunate. Um, and I always try and help out when I can there. Um, in terms of the markets, people pop up, people are selling stuff at traffic lights. They sell like balloons or fruit or um, anything, literally anything they have their hands on, like toys for kids or roses or anything. You can just go like you're driving in your car, hit a crossroads, and there's people that come up to you in the window and like try to sell you stuff. And you can you can do that. I mean, there's just so many different quirks about the country. Um that is super inter interesting. There's people that live in the city, so they're very much like westernized, shall I say. But then you have also uh, a large pop population is Quechua, which is Quechua, but in, in Ecuador. Um, and Quechua, the, the civilization that uh, made the Inca Empire. So Inca means king in Quechua. So up here in Ecuador, and they typically live in the mountains. So up here in Ecuador, uh, the Quechuan, they have, there's a lot of indigenous people that live in the mountains and they come into the city. So they have like the babies on their back with a like a rug around them kind of thing. Uh, they wear like a bowler hat. Um, they have like a specific look. They look weathered from, you know, in the wind and like rosy cheeks. Um, so there's a lot of that, like different colors as well. Like in Andean colors are like very bright. You might picture it in Peru where you have like the rugs and stuff that are like very multicolored and, you know, um, artisan, artisanal, I don't know how you would say that, like very artisan rugs. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it has like so much culture behind the country and it's impossible to tell everything about it because there's so many different quirks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I just wanted to get a little taste there. And is that a tattoo of smile on your finger? Yeah. Yeah. Smile? Yeah. So it was, um, I was on the coast. I was in this town, Montanito, when I was 27. I was big in the party scene and all that kind of thing. Not so much anymore. You were big in the party scene? Well, I say I, I was big. I was very much into the party scene. Yeah. Um, not so much anymore. I, I like growing that kind of thing. I like my peace and my quiet, my tranquility. But um, 
yeah, I was on the coast and I wanted something to show that I was a photographer that wasn't, but without having a camera or whatever it might be. So I just got like smile here on my finger and it's my trigger finger. So it's whenever I take a photo, it has this like smile, but it can be hidden in the hand. So it's not, not so visible uh, at the same time. That's clever. Yeah. Is that the only tattoo you have? No, I've got a few. I've got uh, three, four. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Um, I've got one that's um, it's on my calf here and it's about, it's actually about Peru really, but also in Latin America. So it's the shape of Latin America, uh, shape of South America. And it has like the coca leaves, which are like a, a leaf that you would take to help you with the altitude in Peru. And the Andes are incredibly high. At the moment I'm sitting at Quito, I think sits at about 2,800 meters, if I'm not wrong. Um, so yeah, it's um, I have like, it has different things about, it has the Nazca lines of Peru and like the hummingbirds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's like a, a whole tattoo dedicated to like the culture of Peru. Yeah, mm. which I love. So yeah, that, well, that's great. I mean, if anybody ever forgets to smile, they have a visual reminder right there in front of them. It's funny because sometimes I'll... I'll well, what if you I'll don't know. want somebody to smile on the picture? You're yeah, screwing exactly, yourself, exactly, man. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Well, very much, my subjects are very much, uh, they don't speak English, so they probably won't even understand it. But often I am kind of sat here like this thinking or I might look a bit miserable or whatever, deep in thought, whatever it is, you know, but I have smile just covering my mouth there. And yeah. it's kind of like, it's quite funny because obviously I don't look happy, but I have like smile written on my, on my finger. <laughs> well, it's a good reminder for yourself, I guess. To good smile. reminder for myself. Yeah. <laughs> Be happy. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, we covered a lot today. I, I, you know, I could keep going, but I, uh, I want to respect your time and, and want to give you an opportunity here to share, you know, anything you'd like where people can find you if they have questions. Anything else we missed, feel free. Yeah, so there is one story that I think people might be interested in hearing. It's kind of like an adventurous story, um, kind of like one of those fear stories, shall I say, what, a situation you don't want to be in. Um, so there's been a couple of times where I felt like in my travels where I've like felt like I was could probably die in this situation right now. So I'll talk about one of them. Um so one of them, I was down in, I moved down to Peru um, last year and I traveled by bus all the way down, which took, South America is so big. And even just for the neighboring con- country, it took me maybe about four or five days just to get from where I am here in Quito in the middle of the country down to Peru into the Amazon. So I, I took the route for the narco trail, basically. So as everyone knows, the cartel is a massive thing here with the drug trade and the coca leaf which is made into cocaine eventually all of that so i took a route that was kind of like and i had a lot of experience under my belt with indigenous people and how like these people how you should be etc um so i went from the andes which is where the coca leaves are exported or like traffic shall i say out of the country illegally um and then they to the Amazon, which is where it's kind of grown. So all, along that route, which is about like a four or five day uh, drive, it was um, it was full of like coca fields and everything. So to grow coca field, coca leaves, it's not illegal because like coca leaves are like very much a thing. They're an amazing leaf you can have, put it in your tea and it gives you like energy and everything else. And it's a really good leaf to have. It's just a shame that it's being produced into cocaine really. Um, so the coca leaf itself is amazing. Even if you bring coca leaves into the States, you can't do it. It's illegal just because of that reason, even though the leaf is like an amazing, has amazing properties in it. So anyway, I was driving through all these coca fields to arrive into the Amazon. We took, arrived to the port, we took a canoe down, further down river, and you start hearing the accents of, we're in Peru, but you hear Colombian accents, you hear different things. Um, and we took a trip that was kind of, adventurous it was kind of interesting and where we just rode for four days down river uh, with no motor um and my my job was to like you know document it at the same time so where we rode um was in a certain part where it was narco territory so there were rules on the on the river so in general it's pretty safe even if you are there there are indigenous communities you're with them it's pretty safe you need to have permissions to go there you get them from the government and all that which is in lima in the capital and you have to um make your way and if you don't have those permission slips then 
who knows what's going to happen to you. Um, fortunately, we got all that done. Day one, start rowing down the river, working out the laws of the river. You think a river would just like goes downstream, but it doesn't work like that. There's different like like swirls in the river and like ways it comes back up and down. So you have to like navigate it really, really well. Um, so that was like a learning curve in itself. Towards the day comes to an end. You're not allowed in the river past four o'clock because four o'clock is when it, I mean, it gets dark about six, but you know, four o'clock is the time where the narco traffic starts moving. So you don't want to be on the river because if you're, you're spotted on that river, then, you know, I don't want to say what might happen to you, but obviously it's not going to end well. So you want to make sure you are in a community where you are um, before then. So we row down the river, approach us about three o'clock. We get into a spot where we have guides with us um, who lived in the area for their whole life, etc. cetera. Um, and he's like, oh, yeah, we'll stay with my brother. Everyone has a brother. Everyone has a cousin. Everyone, you know, everyone's like family. So we're like, okay, cool. We get to the spot, but the the boss or the chief of the community wasn't there. So the chief gives the word you know, to whether or not, gives the rules out, you know. So we couldn't get the final word off the chief t- to stay there. So we didn't know what to do. So we were like, okay, let's continue now. We'll go to my cousin, for example. So we went down there. And as we're rowing down to the beach, we're in three different canoes and we're going on paddle. Uh, I arrived first with my guide who had lived in that community for 20 years or so. Um, and there's people on the on the beach side there and they are, they have their, bows and their arrows they also have shotguns they um they have like they're all drunk off their their potato starch alcoholic drink they make them make their uh called masato and they um they're there and basically i couldn't understand what they're saying but it's very obvious what they're saying they were just saying get out of here right now leave um and then i'm like okay let, let's leave and then my friends are just behind me like they're just behind me trying to like tackle the way to enter onto the beach because that itself is a bit of a skill. So, and they couldn't hear us because of the water and all of this kind of stuff. And we're like, no, we got to go. We got to go. Like, we're not welcome here whatsoever. And at this time, it's like four o'clock, getting a bit dark now. We're like, oh no, like this isn't a situation where we want to be. Eventually, we go further down river. It's like almost dark, like the sun's setting, six o'clock. Um, and we managed to find a place that was like his brother-in-law or something. They were on the beach and they were like, yeah, you can come and camp out on the beach. Like, no problem. So for me, I was like, right, sweet. Get all our stuff, unload the canoe, start pitching my tent on this beach here. Um, so then I'm just like set up before dark. I can see everything, everything's set and ready to go. So whilst I'm doing that, I'm quite hard of vision. So I need glasses and I didn't have my glasses. My friend comes up to me. He's like, Mark, can you just come with us for a for a moment so we're all together and I was like yeah sure no worries thinking it could be like a photo it could be like whatever and then as I'm looking around it was like a special ops like operation where it was kind of they were came in at the same time from all areas where people came up river down river from the jungle skirting around the sides of the beach like everyone like they surrounded us like straight away like all at the same time it was amazing how they, how they worked um but we're all together with our guides and everything and they came up to us and they all had their guns and their bows and arrows and like machetes or whatever. And I was like, oh no, like this is not good. Um, And then one of the French guys with us, he decides, for some reason, he decides, I'm going to start filming this. So he starts, he gets his camera phone out and starts like filming like what's happening to us. So then they run up to him immediately. He's like, provido, provido. So he's like, you can't film here. You can't film. And he was like, whoa, whoa, sorry. And he, his Spanish wasn't amazing. So he was like, sorry, sorry. Um, delete the photo, delete the photo. And he's like going through. And we're like, oh, no, like this is getting worse. And you can smell like the alcohol on them and you can smell everything. And these are indigenous people. These aren't the narcos. Um, but it's all very much like a change of energy because because of the narco situation. Like they don't want anyone coming onto the river without them knowing. Um, so they asked us for like the permission forms and everything else. And so we gave it off and then they looked through it and they were like, okay, calling off the names and with the passport number and everything. I was like, oh God, I don't remember my passport number. I used to when I was traveling, but now I just don't. So, um, and I was like, I can't go into my bag because if I get my passport out of my bag, then they might think I'm taking out like a camera or they might see I have a camera or whatever it might be. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. My name's Mark. Sorry, I don't have my passport number. I don't have my passport number. They're like, 
they were, they were just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever, okay, sure, fine, and then like start calling off. And we're obviously like in fear in this moment where we're like full of like angry indigenous people with their weapons, drunk as well, we don't, don't know what decision they're going to make um, in an area that obviously isn't great for tourism. Um, and then after things got flowing, it was kind of like, okay, yeah, no problem. You're allowed to camp here. No problem. It's absolutely fine. Just make sure you go on in the morning. Because uh, we were just explaining that we were, we're just like we're tourists. We're, we're trying to get to know the area and like see if it's an area there where maybe we could bring tourism or whatever, like thought of whatever we could uh, to try and like help them, you know. Um, so we're here for help and we're not here just for like, you know, as a part of the narco scheme or whatever it might be. So, yeah, we kind of like were on our way, but that whole night wasn't a restful sleep because it was kind of like, what happens if like some random guy in that community has an idea of like, oh yeah, let's just go and mess with them for a bit. Or, you know, anyone can easily, when you're drinking, like come up with a random idea of like, oh yeah, let's just go and, you know, do this, that'd be funny. Um, so it was like a very like unrestful sleep that night. And in the morning we just packed our things and moved on. <laughs> Yeah, not a, not a situation I would bring anyone else into, obviously. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I guess when you get off the beaten path in that way... Pushing the limits, just I guess. don't know what's going There's to happen. There's so much. Yeah. And yeah. obviously, some people listening now might think, oh, you're an idiot for doing it. You're, you know, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter how experienced you are. You shouldn't be in those areas. Um, for me, it was just like a moment for me to, like, just understand, like, the way how things work. Um, because actually in the narco territories, it's not actually that dangerous. You just need to make sure you have the permissions, you have your guides and you have everything else. I'm not recommending anyone to go in those areas, uh, but it's not as bad as you think. It's just obviously if you put yourself in a bad situation, then that's what's going to happen. Hmm. Yeah. I'm glad you came out of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that was one of the moments where I was like, this can go a little too far south. Yeah. 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 Are you getting back to the uk at all anytime um, soon i'm actually going back this june um i've got a couple of friends weddings there um, i'm gonna set up an exhibition there um and i've got a couple of things um where i'm gonna work back in my old tv station they have they have an event called the island games which is it's kind of like the olympics but just for the islands around the whole world it's only specifically for islands so it's quite a big event like a global event um and so i'm going to be filming that which would be kind of cool but um yeah, so that's my plan to go next June or July for a month or so, a couple of months, do a bit of work, see some friends, family, because before that, it's, it's been a few years uh, since I got back. So that'll be nice. Yeah. Well, that, I'm sure it'll be a bit of reverse culture shock. Oh, yeah. Ways, which... Oh, it's so different. Like like sharing my life here is just completely different to what it, anyone could understand back in the UK. My friends don't, like they know roughly what I'm doing, but they... They probably don't really know what I'm doing. Like, um, so yeah, it's amazing. And in answer to your question earlier, you said like, if there's anything else I wanted to add or how people can hear, um, from me or whatever, uh, my Instagram handle would be Mark Fox photo, PH photo. And, uh, that's the same with all my handles really, but I only really use Instagram, my website, Mark's Fo Mark Fox photo as well. Um, but also I am offering, if anyone is interested in any kind of like tour, um, that's not in narco territory, <laughs> a lot more safer, um, any kind of tour and they, they don't really know how to go off the beaten path themselves. I do offer um, photography masterclasses and I take people in a situation where they'll be learning how to take macro photographs of wildlife or um, indigenous cultural por portraits or anything like that. So I do offer that um, and I've this year is when I started launching it. So it's slow moving off the ground, but it's definitely something. So if, if someone's interested in that, it can be personalized or you can just hop onto a tour. And that next one will be in August, I believe. We're in the current stages of planning now. Um, so yeah, just get in touch. Cool. We'll link up to uh, your website and Instagram and all in the show notes. And ah, cool. Thank you look very forward much. to uh, staying in touch. And I hope that you have a nice trip back home and you enjoy some of the the pub culture while you're there, I guess, you know, that's the, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. A couple right? of beers. Even if you're not drinking beer, it's just about connecting. I always love that about, about the UK is uh, just being able to yeah, have a social yeah. environment like that where everybody's connecting. And I'm sure it'll be, um, probably be pretty interesting for you to, to be back there for a, for a period of time. So for sure. I, I love, I love where I live in the summer when it gets the winter, it's like very cold. It rains a lot. Like, 
the energy of people get pretty low. Um, so I always try and visit and make sure st- strategically I go in like summer periods. So from June to August is, is the best time <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Right on. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks for reaching out and taking the time to just yeah hop on, share some of your stories, advice, and the work you're doing. And yeah, I can look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Mark. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Take care. There you have it. Thanks to Mark Fox for coming on the show and sharing his stories. I love when I get to hear about somebody who has created a life of travel just by having the guts to go do it, which ties in with what I wanted to share today about something that I think is never the wrong move. You know, with Mark, his passion for conservation and the Amazon and photography and all the things we talked about at the top, you can see how that was put together in a way that allows him to live the life he wants to live. But very intentionally, I mean, he went off to do this stuff and to be around it. And that's what I want to talk about here today as we close out. Just this idea of having the guts to put yourself where you feel you need to be, even if you don't know why. To me, that's always the right move. This is what I was talking about at the top of the show. What's always the right move? It's it's putting yourself where you feel you need to be. And I'm talking about geographically. You know, back in my nomad days, I don't know why. I just wanted to keep traveling. I did it anyway even though I didn't know where it was going. And it was the right move. When I wanted to settle somewhere, Colorado felt like the right move. And it was. It felt like that to me. It still does. When I found out I was having kids, Norway felt like the right place to raise them. And it's that feeling. You know what I mean? That feeling where where you've got that inner calling, where you feel like you need to be somewhere. For whatever reason, it might be, let's say, a real-world example, somebody who works in the startup world. And they're like, you know what? I just... I live here in the middle of the country. I, I got to be in San Francisco where all the action is. I mean, there's something to that. And if you feel like that's where you need to be, you can get out there and make it happen. I, that's something I've never regretted in life. And I think even if you can't explain it, for some reason you have a feeling that you need to be in a certain place. Maybe this is resonating with you. I don't know where you are while you're listening to this right now. But if there is a feeling uh, and some place is calling to you, explore that. That's my challenge for you today. I I love to see how that came together for Mark and with what he's doing today. And that's why I find these interviews and sharing these stories so inspiring. And I hope you've been enjoying them as well. I did get a nice review from a listener. I wanted to give a shout out and say thanks to Mark, who said, uh, the inspiring stories, topics, and enlightening conversations keep me connected to my inner traveler in a profound way, referring to this podcast. And uh, that's the goal here. That's exactly what we're trying to do is uh, to keep uh, you connected to your inner traveler, whether you're on the road or at home. And I hope I'm doing a good job of that. Speaking of my job, it is to serve you. And if you ever have anything you want me to do, produce, guests you want me to have on, comments to share, anything, you could drop me a line, leave a link to my voicemail box in all the show notes. And of course, you can reach me on email. Jason at zero to travel.com is my email. I'm here to serve you. This is all about you and this community, uh, and I'm just here to produce the the content you want. So let me know what you'd like. I'd love to hear from you, and uh, don't forget, this is not just a one-way conversation. This is a community, so I hope you have uh, time to get in touch if you haven't yet. Okay, without further ado, let me leave you with a quote. First, I should remind you, don't forget, we're going to be doing three episodes a week through the remainder of the year, so don't forget to follow and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss this coming episodes next week all about upgrading your bucket list destination theme. You're going to love it. And I hope it helps you discover some new places you might want to consider visiting in the coming year and beyond. Okay, this quote from Matsu Basho, who said, learn the rules and then forget them. (laughs) Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time. Peace and love to you and yours. Cheers. This podcast.